and we're happy to welcome Stable Therapeutics and CEO Andreas Javad. Welcome Andreas. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Andreas, I'm the CEO of Stable Therapeutics and I'm here to tell you about Stable Therapeutics and our exciting journey uh, going forward. So just let me start a little bit with discussing chronic low back pain, a disease that affects millions of patients but where there's today very, very few alternatives for the patients. Patients suffer without any effective treatments, and that's really what Stable would like to do. We would like to offer patients a simple injectable treatment that targets the underlying cause of the back pain. And that's something that I would like to, for you to really remember from this presentation, that we are treating the underlying cause. We're actually aiming to make the patient long-term pain relieved. It's not just treating the cause, it's actually treating the underlying reason for the, the type of back pain. So we are developing a single injection treatment with the goal of really offering something where there's currently a lack of effective treatments. And why, why work within the pain space? I think it's really is about the fact that there are no effective treatments. There's really been a lack of innovation through the last decade almost. You've tried stem cells for a lot of periods, but you haven't really been able to succeed with any effective treatments, which leaves a lot of patients without effective treatments. We also have the opportunity as, as a company within this field to actually innovate and to become the first player to offer something that really can help this type of patients. And why should you invest in Stable and what makes Stable unique? I think we have evolved from, from a small company to a major player within the field through the last couple of years. We proceeded from a preclinical stage through a phase one trial that I will come back to later and we're now conducting a large clinical phase two trial in three different countries in Europe. We have a track record to really progress this innovation forward in a very rapid pace to be a pharmaceutical development company. And I think that's also lays in our known drug substance. We're working with lactic acid as our API, which gives us a lower development risk and a higher probability to actually be able to push this drug all the way to the clinics, to the market, and to help all these patients that currently are lacking effective treatments. So a typical patient, when, when we talk about back pain, perhaps you thought, think a little bit more about the elderly population, but degenerative disc disease, which is the diagnosis that we are targeting, is really a young population. It's a working population. A typical patient for us is somewhere between 30 to 50 years old. So it's really in middle of life, and it's really a period where the small things becomes very difficult. It's difficult to put on your socks in the morning, it's difficult to lift your kids, it's difficult to travel both for business and pleasure. So it's really a drastic decrease in quality of life for all these, type, these patients. And what's really sad, as I was saying in the beginning, is that there are no effective treatments focusing on the underlying cause. It's physiotherapy, it's analgesics, but it's only momentumly treating the patients, not giving them a long-term pain decrease. And we believe that around 30% of all patients suffering from degenerative disc disease, which stands for around 40% of all back pain in the world, could actually be helped by our treatment, STA363, which is a single injection directly into the disc. So all these patients, they are suffering without any actual improvement. What, what are they what are they doing currently? What, why is there really, really a large need for new type of innovation? I think opioids is really the tragic part of back pain because a lot of patients is overusing their overdoses, their misuse, their abuse of opioids. And if back pain is not killing you directly, a lot of patients die due to back pain indirectly caused by opioid overdoses. And in the US, around 50,000 people die every year. So payers and the FDA really acknowledge that we need to find new alternatives for this patient group. We need to help them really getting away from opioids, but really our goal in Stable is getting them away from actually starting it in the first place. So being a second line treatment when physiotherapy and analgesic fails, Stable should be the option for all patients to really get the opportunity to get long-term pain relieved. So just giving you the quick numbers, around 100 million patients suffer every year, uh, currently in the US, in Europe, and in UK. 
And as I was saying, around 30% corresponds to around 30 million that we can target directly. And every year, around 11.5 million, corresponding to 3.5 million patients every year, is the target population that we can treat on a yearly basis. So as I was saying, it's a vast problem. I think the numbers, especially looking at the prevalence, really demonstrate that there is a vast need for new improved treatments to actually help all these patients currently suffering to go away from their current problems. So, degenerative disc disease, why, uh, why can we treat it and what is the actual causes of this type of back pain? Looking at degenerative disc disease, we pr primarily have two components. It's a leakage of inflammatory substances and it's an instability of the segment, which is the rationale for where a minority of the patients received a spinal fusion. So the reason for getting degenerative disc disease is quite under unknown. There are a couple of factors. There are lifestyle factors. If you look at the spine, it has a curvature, so it's a lot of pressure in the lower discs. So lumbar disc generation is mostly common in the lower two discs, and there is a connection with, with obesity. But there are also genetic factors that some people's, some people's discs are generating more quickly than others. So the really problem with these patients is the lack of effective treatments. And what we are doing here is that we have our treatment, which is SDA363. It's a single injection, you only inject it once, and then you get a lifelong change of the disc, a lifelong decrease of the pain. The injection directly into the disc, it transforms the disc into connective tissue, and this transformation stabilizes the segment and eliminates the possibility of leakage. So by doing this, we are removing the underlying cause of the back pain, helping the patients becoming pain relieved over a long period of time. So the really important things about stable is it's a minimally invasive. We increase quality of life. We have established safety and tolerability, but also working with lactic acid gives us a lower risk of negative side effects later on in development. And we're aiming to have a disease modifying label, which will be very important from a payer perspective, from a reimbursement perspective, and also something that the authorities are really looking for to approve. So what have we done so far? We have done, performed a clinical phase one trial where we established that the treatment was safe and tolerable. We saw no side effects. But the most important thing that we saw from this trial was that we established something that we as define as biological efficacy, which means that we could see, based on MRI images, that before treatment and after treatment, in the highest dose and the med medium dose, we saw a transformation into connective tissue. We didn't see that in the lower dose or in the placebo-treated group, which gives us a very good indication of which type of doses that works in this population and which doses we should actually continue to develop to be able to demonstrate efficacy or decrease in pain. The study was conducted in Sweden, uh, in Stockholm. We included 15 patients in three different doses, and it was a placebo double-blinded study. And we followed the patient for up to 12 months. So based on this very positive phase one trial, we continue the development into a larger clinical phase two B trial. And we were able to publish uh, last year very positive interim data. We saw that we have a, have a lower variability than we expect initially, and we have a high uh, quality of the study conduct. So this gives us a very positive feeling for the continuity of this trial. It also gives us a higher probability to get conclusive data. So the goal of the trial is to see pain de decrease. So the primary endpoint is pain, but we also measure function as a secondary endpoint because for us and for all, for all of the patients, it's very important. Pain is one parameter, of course. It's very important to decrease the patient's pain, but it's also a lot about quality of life. It's about getting back to society, and therefore function is something that, that's valuable for both the patients, but also for payer or physicians, and they see that both pain and function will be two parameters that would be very valuable for the, for the development, but also very reasonable to focus on when we are conducting a larger trial. We brought the two doses, the high and the medium dose from the phase one trial into this phase two B trial. And we also have a placebo control trial. So it's a double blinded study, which means that either the patient nor the physician nor stable knows if you got active treatment or placebo. We followed the patients for up to 12 months. 
we aim to include around 100 uh, valuable patients in the trial, and we're conducting the trial in the Netherlands, in Russia, and in Spain. And we aim to have the top-line results during 2023. And I would also like to point out that conducting a trial in, in Russia in these days are, of course, something that is very challenging. And for us, it's very important that we have been active in Russia for a couple of years and we have included a lot of patients in Russia. And we believe that it's our, we really need to take care of these patients. We have an ethical goal towards them because they are in the trial and we need to follow them up. We need to ensure that they get the right treatment and that's why we have decided to continue the trial in Russia to really give the patients what we t t told in the, in the beginning of the trial. So based on this we really are continuing developing the trial and we're very very happy that we have had some challenges during the COVID with patient recruitment. We've done a lot of different initiatives. We have worked with incentives, we've worked with referral networks, we've worked with different types of social media uh, campaigns to really drive patient recruitment. And we're very happy to say that we have now recruited more than 75% of all the patients. And we also see a very positive trend in the continuance of the patient recruitment. So we really are on track with our goal of treating the last patient in, in the trial during 2022. And as I was saying, have the top line results in 2023. So it's very, very positive currently. We really have a good, good flow in the trial and we're really aiming to be able to, to give the next important milestone with 100% of the patient recruited. And that's also something that we would like to discuss with our partners, to go out to discuss with them, to really take the next step with STABLE. Because as, as we are progressing, a partnership for the continuance of the development is very important for us. So that's what we are focusing on now. We have a large interest in STABLE. We really see that people and different types of companies are really seeing the enormous potential in this area. We have a unique option with our treatments. Really, the disease-modifying label is something that they really see as, as very beneficial. And also to be able to use the fact that you would like to decrease opioids. That's something that's really are a driver for this type of innovation that STABLE is, is doing. So we're focusing of, on primarily uh, pharmaceutical companies, specialty pharma companies, but we also see that medtech companies are more and more looking into the space and being a single injection working towards the orthopedic department, there definitely are medtech companies that could be a potential partner. So the goal is to enter into a license with the phase 2B data and we are aiming for either a merchant acquisition, a license agreement, or a co-development for the next step, which is a clinical phase three trial. Sable is a, a virtual company. So we have a rather small core team uh, working with experts all over the globe where we see that we have the right competence for, for our development. So we have the knowledge from early stage development through pharmaceutical development to business development. And that's also the same for in, in our board with really the early stage development, business development. So we have the financing, we have everything we need to really successfully develop this company going forward. And we're also very happy that we work with very competent ad advisors that helps us guide through both in, in one way regulatory questions but mostly scientific discussions and really getting the patient perspective of the development. So to summarize this, why should you invest in STABLE? I think it's really about the, the treatment potential. It's a game-changing solution. It's really something that could help a large portion of the patients. It's, I've said it, said it many times, but it's disease modifying. It's very important for us. And we also have the track record with working with lactic acid, which gives us a lower development risk. The risk of actually failing in later stage development is much lower in the case of STABLE compared to other uh, pharmaceutical development projects. We have granted patents in the markets that we would like to be. We have an ongoing trial, recruited most of the patients. And I think it's always, uh, from, from my perspective, I was called, but I would say that we have a very attractive valuation of the companies. It's a very interesting journey to, to start with STABLE currently, that we have an ongoing trial, we're very close of recruiting the last patient, and then it's really the next step going into partnership towards releasing a drug that really can help all the patients that currently are suffering without any effective treatments. So with that, I would like to round up and say thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. 
So if we start with the clinical study uh, and considering the current events in Russia, do they in any way affect the progress of your study or are you able to keep up the, the speed you would like to? I would say that uh, from, from a logistic perspective and from a data capturing perspective, we, we are not seeing any, any issues with Russia. We have, we have the supply of, of drug products uh, locally in the country and we're working with, with the clinics uh, locally. But I think also for us it's very important about, about data capturing data security. So we have all the data that are collected are collected digital, digitally and transfer, for, transferred to service in, in Switzerland and in Sweden. So we really continuously have the data secured outside of Russia and I think that's very important. And I think also from, from an inclusion perspective we work with centralized reading. So we have all the magnetic uh, resonance images are sent to Sweden before a patient is actually included. So we have very good control of which patients that are entering the trial or not. One thing that I was a bit curious about was you said you would had to come up with some innovative ways to recruit the patients. Could you talk a little bit more about that? You mentioned incentives and so on. Yeah, I think it's, it's always uh, in clinical development. For, for some reason, uh, you have very positive prognosis of how many patients you will treat, but when you start a trial, for some reason, they disappear. Uh, so what we've been doing is that there's no, no single activity that's really changed everything, but it's, it's uh, different types of activities that really patch this together. And I think referral networks, for us, it's a lot about finding the patients early in their pain progression, and that we are doing at the radiology department. So working closely with them has been very successful. Social media, it's something that we, uh, we worked with in our first trial. Uh, we also worked with it a little bit in this trial, but we saw that in uh, in Russia, for example, social media is not uh, a channel for people to actually go to the clinic. So we work more with, with medical websites, we worked with KOL presentations and trying to leverage uh, best practice. So it's a lot of interaction between the clinics, how to find patients, how to actually uh, discuss with your colleagues. So they are, are broadening the net where you actually can find these patients. So it's, it's a lot of different fa factors, but I think best practice and working closely with your radio radiology would be the two, two factors that's really been changing the, the, the development. But then of course COVID has been a challenge and been really slowing things down and with a decrease in COVID things are of course progressing uh, quicker. And then finally you talked about the US market as, as being potentially very important. How do you have a strategy for how to enter the US market? How are you preparing the ground for, for Stable's entrance to, to the US? I think the US is, of course, a very important market for us. And I think what we've been doing so far is, is having presence with, with really key opinion leaders. We work with very closely with them uh, to get a presence. But we also are, are planning to have interactions with, with the FDA uh, later this year to discuss uh, the development program going forward. So I think it's, it's a lot about regulatory currently, uh, but also from a partnering perspective. We, we have interactions with uh, di different types of, of companies, both big and small. And the US is, of course, an, a market where we're very active. Well, then we thank you so much for coming, yeah. Andreas. Thank you. Thank you.